Today's guest is Mary Roach. She is the author of New York Times bestselling books such as Stiff, which is a must read for me, uh, Spook, Bonk, Gulp, Grunt, Packing for Mars, and Fuzz. Mary, how are you today? I am just fine, Sheldon. Uh, nice to be here. How how hot is it in Broward County? Ooh, that is a that's a trick question. I did not expect to get the the first question. Um, insanely hot, which is pretty good. We're still in the summer season, and we're not yet into the summer -er season, which starts in August. <laughs> the summer. Where it gets. Oh, yeah. I know. My my mother in law lives. Uh, in uh, Delray Beach, which is not that far, so I know. I actually live in Delray Beach. Actually. Yeah, really. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I love Delray. It's adorable. It is. I'm on the west side, so I'm not in the cute east side. I'm more farmlands. Yeah. Well, same with my mother-in-law. Yeah. Maybe you guys are neighbors. Who knows? <laughs> we could be. <laughs> so to kick off, Mary, this this question was not on my list until yesterday. So. To start off, I'd like to apologize and ask for your forgiveness for not following the clauses in your contract. Um, our oriental rug is not to the, your specifics. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a whole oriental rug um, story and I would like you to tell us how that came about and tell oh, us a little yeah. detail about the oriental rug in your contract. Yeah, and first of all, I can't believe it, it's still called an oriental, it should be a, what, an Asian rug. <laughs> Oriental rug just sounds so unwoke. But anyway, so yeah, when I do uh, speaking gigs, I have a speaking agent and there's a contract <laughs> and uh, in, in it are the requirements, special requirements like dietary requirements or whatever. Um, and mine has nothing really. I don't, I don't care whatever people do whatever people have decided to do is fine with me. But, but somehow um, my agent, it was a different agent stepping in, I don't know, but they cut and pasted um, another speaker's demands. So um, I showed up at this event and people were kind of treating me strangely. Um, they were kind of like, ooh, like, like I was gonna bite their head off or something. And I'm like, is it, you know, they, they said, they came up to me and said, um, Ms. Roach, we're really sorry about the rug. I'm like, what? Looks like a good rug. Well, but it's not the dimensions of Oriental rug that you requested. You requested a five by seven Oriental rug, and this is bigger. I'm like, what? <laughs> what? And they, t and I'm like, what is this in the contract? So not only was that in the contract, but there was a request that on stage there be flowers and no mixed blooms, only one type of flower. Uh, and that the chair must have a cushion so that I'm s pushed somewhat forward in my chair. It turned out it was some <laughs> woman from the cooking network or something, the food network. Uh, and they just stuck those in there and, or they more likely they forgot to take them out you know, oh my you know, gosh. The, uh, uh, when they did my contract anyway. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> uh, that was embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> You know what the weirdest thing about that was when I was re I was watching the video, it was like, this is not a location for a rug. Like it's it just didn't make any sense where it was. Like someone had to have like questioned that. Oh, that well, well, they, you know they put rugs on stages, but mm -hmm. you know, like a, but yeah, it it the the, the, the dimensions who, who, any rug will do. I don't even care if there is a rug. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, oh One time gosh. as a joke, as a joke, I said my demands were, you know, around, it was around Easter, you know, those little peeps, mm -hmm. those little marshmallow eggs. I said, I've I, never I, had one. What? But yeah. Yeah. I've I never know, had I, one. I, they're disgusting. But, but I, it, as a joke, I said purple peeps and Slim Jims. <laughs> <laughs> I show up and they put them in the room, in the green room. They had them. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Okay, that I didn't know about. So that's a tidbit I'm gonna take with me today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more fun question. Okay, so I've probably been reading your book since 2011. Um, and it's only in researching for this program that I've come across a Mary Roach on American Idol. Oh God. Um, <laughs> one of the very small one review ratings for one of your books says, angriest American Idol contestant. And I thought, 
That's a little odd. So to set the record straight, <laughs> do you know about this person? And do people approach you about this? Oh, yeah, not so much anymore, but I, I, not only do I know about that Mary Roach, I saw that program, and um, <laughs> she, yes, she's very, she was one of a kind, that Mary Roach, and also, it was around the time I was setting up a website, and I couldn't use MaryRoach.com, because that Mary Roach, American Idol had bought that site, just to, because she was such a phenom, you know, she was mm -hmm. so bizarre, Um but around the time my stepdaughters who were, I don't know, in their early teens at that point, <laughs> they were quoting this line because because Mary Roach, that character, got booted off the show. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Simon Cowell, I think it was, said, well, at least we don't have to listen to Mary Roach anymore. <laughs> so my <laughs> stepdaughters are going around going, at least we don't have to listen to Mary Roach anymore. <laughs> Yes, no. People have said. People have said. Uh, have have said to me, "Are you the uh, American Idol contestant?" And I'm like, first of all, do I, I don't really look like her, and uh, she's a, a probably a better singer than me, as bad as she was. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure. I was just like, "What do you mean, American Idol? Like, why is this even coming up?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and the audacity of her to take the website because when I saw the video, she actually wanted to change her last name. Because I think she didn't think it was like marketable enough. Oh, really? I don't, I don't, yeah, I can't remember. I just remember hearing her. I remember what she wore, those white pants and like a red and white shirt. Mm -hmm. And um, nobody must have given her advice about <laughs> what to wear on American Idol. And uh, I just remember the performance. I don't remember the aftermath or the conversations that she, she was, she was upset though. Yeah, right. She was really angry. Yeah, she was. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, you got a one star rating, one of your few just because of that. And I was like, you clearly <laughs> have not done your research. <laughs> well, that's a that's a, that's a one star rating um that is I'll take because it's hilarious. Yeah. Although it does bring down my average, so. And not by a lot. I think there was only like mm. I don't know, 6 out of like 435. You know what, yeah, whatever. There's always <laughs> whatever. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Okay, so first real question, and I have my list of questions because I just want to be as prepared as possible today. Okay, so I have an idea that the life and author is laid back and peaceful. You wake up, you put your cap on, you walk to the nearest cafe where you have unlimited Wi-Fi and coffee, and ideas just pour out on the page. Um, <laughs> so if it's anything like how people imagine the life of a librarian, I'm guessing this is total fiction. So let us know, what is it like to be a writer for a living? Yeah, yeah. Um, the whole thing about the, first of all, the, the cap. I like the cap. That was a nice touch. <laughs> my, writing, my writing cap, I just donned my cap. Yeah. And then I, uh, yeah, the idea is flowing. Um, uh, I do write. Actually, I do sometimes write. Uh, well, I go in phases. But the, my last book, I wrote a lot of it in a cafe. Uh, and, it, and it is fun to write in a cafe. Uh, um, this, I like when they're playing music, certain kind of music, not, not necessarily music I know, but just has the right kind of beat and it's, I like noise and then it, it forces me to focus and that's kind of fun. Uh, so that is as close as to the fantasy I think that you just portrayed as I usually get. Um, there's a lot more of me, um, uh, berating myself thinking this isn't fresh enough, funny enough, this is flat, you can't write. You know, that kind of thing. I get a, a, a lot of that goes on. But then eventually, you know, you kind of get in the zone and it is and time goes by and you feel OK about what you've done. Uh, that's, just, you know, so so it's sort of a mix. And of course, for me, a lot of my job as a writer is mm -hmm. reporting, emailing people, setting things up, setting up research trips, um, transcribing interviews, um, poking around, <clears throat> looking for ideas and contacts on the internet so there's a ton of stuff that has nothing to do with writing it's kind of like you know astronauts people think wow i'd like to be an astronaut be in space well 0.1 percent of an astronaut's <laughs> life uh career is in space you know they are uh just doing a lot of stuff on the ground yeah i imagine they're still doing paperwork 
paperwork, appearances, helping on projects. Yeah. Talk, so this sounds, talking to libraries. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of that sounds like, I don't know, a lot of work. Is it just you or is there a team roach in the background helping out with some of this? <laughs> Team Roach. Yeah. Come on in. Come on in, Team Roach. <laughs> yeah, no. There, it's me. It is it is just me. Um, and that's fine. I, I'm not very good at, at delegating things. I'm not very – I mean, I, I don't know how people collaborate on books. That seems to me like some definition of hell <laughs> to have to try to – I don't know because I've I couldn't even have an assistant because I need to download my whole brain into that person because when I say I'm poking around looking for material that fits a certain chapter I know when I see it you know I I know oh, that'll that'll work I can I can use that I need to get that you know track down that whatever it is uh, <clears throat> but uh, but I just know it when I see it so an assistant <clears throat> isn't going to be it's just more, I think it would just add stress. I'd be like, oh, I don't have enough stuff for you today. I don't know what I'm going to, I don't know what to have you do. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I do, I do everything myself with the exception of, you know, I've, uh, obviously I work with a interpreter if I'm speaking to somebody who doesn't <clears throat> speak English, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so I'll, or sometimes I'll hire a research assistant, you know, for like, there's some Senate subcommittee hearing, and I don't know how to work that website because it's a government website. Yeah, so um, so I do on occasion work with somebody, but um, there's no team. There, my you know my publisher has I, you know I have an agent, definitely mm -hmm. a big part of my career. I have a an editor and a publicist who are at W.W. W. Norton, and they're hugely helpful. So I think that my publisher, I have a whole team there, but they're not Team Roach there. Team W.W. W. Norton, but they do a tremendous amount when it comes to getting the word out about my books and distribution and publicity. Uh, that's that's Team Roach. So it's, you know, those three people, mainly my agent, my editor and my publicist. OK. Um, so let's go back a little to the beginning. I'm sure <laughs> it would be remiss if if I didn't ask how you became a writer. Sure. Yeah, well, I became a writer because I had no other, I had no job skills when I graduated from college. Really, I had no, um, I had no plans and I had no skills and I had no connections. So I thought, well, what can I do? Um, well, and I started out doing a lot of, you know, temp work and catering and, you know, I just went out to San Francisco after I graduated and just was having fun mostly doing, um, uh, odds and ends jobs. I got. A, uh, I ended up getting a job. I mean, you can. You go. To, you go to college. You, you. You know, or even high school. You learn to write. You know, you learn to string sentences together. And so I thought, well, I can do that. So I, I was originally a copy editor and proofreader. I did that initially. I got, and then I moved into public affairs, because that's there's that's a writing related job. <laughs> so I had a job at the San Francisco Zoo. Uh, in the trailer near Gorilla World, and I w was uh, working with the public affairs director, just the two of us, and that was kind of a fun job because I got to I got to write, you know, and it was fun. They were things like go cover the elephant is having laser <clears throat> wart remo removal <laughs> surgery, <laughs> so why don't you go take notes and you can write about it in the membership magazine? So that kind of thing, which was fun for me. Um, but the public affairs part of it, which ha uh, the the dealing with the media, you know, and, and mm -hmm. um, I wasn't, I'm not cut out for that. We had a, one point somebody called and said, I, I heard a rumor that the cheetah was sucked dry by fleas. And I'm calling from the newspaper. This guy was calling from the newspaper. And instead of, you know, denying that, because it wasn't true, I was like, wow. How many fleas do you think that would take? Like, how much blood does a flea take in, in one bite? And how many how much blood is in a cheetah? And how many fleas would that take? So I'm, like, helping this guy to perpetuate this untrue story that was, you know, a malicious thing that I don't know who spread the rumor. But anyway, my boss is like, what are you, what are you doing? You know, the, the, it just was not – I'm not cut out for damage control and – you know, um, 
saying things the right way. I'm kind of a loose cannon. I'm kind of the same way. I probably would have said the same thing like, oh, wow. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. I mean, I'm sorry for the cheetah, but yeah, <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting scenario. Let's let's break that down. <laughs> <laughs> So as you mentioned, after college, you began working um, part-time at a PR job in San Francisco Zoo. Um, you also list bird watching and backpacking as yeah. not hobbies on your website, but I think they're hobbies. Um, did any of these things influence you writing a book on animals? Uh, uh, no, no, I don't think so. Um, I mean, in that, yes, in that, well, what was it? Bird watching? What was the other one? Uh, backpacking and. Oh, backpacking. Yeah. 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 Um, n not directly. Um, I think the, the, the things that end up being book topics for me are things that um, I know there's going to be enough, like a, that I'm stepping into a world I know nothing about, like the military for Grunt or. NASA for pecking for Mars or human wildlife conflict for my last book. So it's, it's um, what appeals to me is that I, that it's completely foreign. I have no idea what people in that world do and I'm curious about it. So, um, so I, so the fact that this something interests me in my private life would, wouldn't, what doesn't really affect it. Cause I'm more drawn to the stuff that's really foreign to me because writing a book is this wonderful key to open a door to a place you could not, not otherwise go. So um, that's usually how I end up choosing my topics. You know, what what kind of world do I want to step into that world? And would it be something that I think a lot of readers might find interesting? You know, is it going to be interesting for them too? And are there places I can actually go and be allowed to go and um, is that access going to be possible? So that's also part of it. You know, I got to have, cause I like to have scenes and dialogue and convert, you know, people and characters. I like to have things set in the present tense. So, um, like I probably wouldn't cover some totally abstract philosophical thing. You know, yes, I would never, <laughs> I would never <laughs> write a philosophy book. And, um, yeah, so, so, so in a, in a word, no. <laughs> So you're saying that you just weren't intrigued by cadavers and you have an interest in cadavers when you started to write stuff? <laughs> it's not uh, yes, a personal like, hobby of yours? It wasn't a personal, right. Get the, um, uh, cutting up cadavers was not a personal hobby <laughs> of mine. Yes, it was. And again, yeah, something I, I really knew nothing about. And people assume it's the opposite. They think, oh, you write about the things that you know well, and many people do. So people, when that book, came out people are like what's wrong with mary roach like <laughs> why is she so interested in this and i was like well i'm interested because i didn't know anything about it and then i stumbled onto. um i think you and i talked before about how that book came up you know mm -hmm. stiff the topic was just i was poking around in the basement of the medical school library at ucsf here in san francisco and i came across this whole collection of it was bound proceedings of the Stapp car crash conference, and it was from the 60s, 50s and 60s. And it was like the early days of automotive safety when they were trying to figure out how to make cars safe. And cadavers played a big part in that because in order to develop, you know, to make cars safer, you kind of have to know specifically how dangerous are they and in what scenarios. And, you know, there's these things called crash sleds where it mimics the forces of a crash. Well, you can't put a live person on a crash sled, sled that is mimicking a you know 50 mile per hour head on crash you need those guys who don't feel any pain and then you do you you know then you look and you see you know what kind of <clears throat> what kind of damage to the body was there you know what does this force cause in the body and then you can use that information to make a dummy a crash test dummy that is uh, gives you the relevant information about whether that would be a lethal crash, whether it would like, you know, just break a rib or would it shear the aorta, what would happen? So um, I had never heard about any of that. And, and it was a weird scene, you know, the crash sled and the cadavers. I was like, whoa, this is pretty trippy. And I, um, 
was talking to an agent around that time and um, he encouraged me to write a book proposal about that and uh, so so it wasn't yeah it wasn't something I had uh, uh, it was not a hobby <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a question but I just wanted to point something out I think that's one thing I really like about your work is that you kind of give insight into things that once we learn about it, you're just like, well, you know, that makes sense. But you never really think about it. Sort of like um, in Fuzz, I think it was a chicken cannon. Yeah, the chicken gun, yeah. The chicken gun for yeah. the, um, to test out like the damage to um, the engines for planes. Yeah. It never occurred to me that they would use that to check, to test right. it out. But now that I know, I'm like, oh, that's really fascinating. Yeah. That's that's my whole life right there, Sheldon. It's like going, whoa, I never knew that. I bet other people would like to know that. And it's fun to write it. It's fun to, when you stumble onto something like the chicken gun, first of all, I just love the to say chicken gun. Yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> the chicken gun. Yeah, it's just, you know, well, somebody, you know, and I love this because cause people, people who are not in science, and that includes me, really, uh, um, you know, as a kid, I used to think, oh, science is not creative you know it's really boring and it's not creative and my whole my whole career has basically been about showing people first of all it's not boring and second of all it's actually really creative like if you you had to come up with a way it's like okay we're designing a a jet say we're designing a jet and we're worried about bird strike because you know you hit a you hit a canada goose or a pelican and you could you could your plane could come down so how are you going to test that you're not going to like hire pelicans you know, to fly into the, so what are you going to do? Uh, and, and to go out and gather pelicans, well, that's going to get you in, in trouble with the, you know, because they're, they may be endangered. Or you just can't go, like, gathering up pelicans and throwing them at planes. So you're like, okay, what could I use? Well, what about a supermarket chicken? And, you know, so, and then you got to build the, the gun to fire the chickens, and you got to test it all. And, and I'm like, God, science is really, it is really creative engineering in particular the one that people go oh my god engineering that must be so, ugh, so much math <laughs> but, um it's so creative it's problem solving it's thinking outside the box you know yeah it is that was one of the most fascinating parts including the woman with the um tiger penises i don't know if i'm like allowed to say that in the recording <laughs> we're gonna get demonetized <laughs> when we upload this but that was also <laughs> fascinating from fuzz as well yeah yeah the, the that was um kind of how i ended up and yeah you could say penis i mean it's a medical word right penis yeah, penis yeah. penis penis you could say that <laughs> what else are you gonna say it's, this it's, is it's, my last day at brara county library <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah the, that's that that the tiger penis lady the tiger genitalia lady um that's kind of how i got sucked into this certainly you shouldn't use the word suck in the same <laughs> sentence <laughs> sorry so now you're really in trouble so <laughs> that's how i got pulled in this direction um i came across this woman who worked at the national wildlife laboratory because i like forensics i find it a really interesting realm of science mm -hmm. and there's this whole area of forensics that deals with trying to identify bits and pieces of animals to determine um, is this an endangered species that was smuggled into the country and therefore is it illegally is it a federal has a federal law been broken here and and so you have to be able to identify um, sometimes small parts and uh, tiger penis is a traditional medicine it's a tr <laughs> it's a traditional medicine um, that's used uh, in parts of Asia or uh, traditionally for enhancing virility. So um, these uh, penises get shipped here and there across the world and it's this one woman's job um, to identify uh, is this in fact a tiger penis and it almost never is and I'll tell you why. First of all it's so much easier to get a deer penis or a cow penis or a horse penis, <laughs> those are easier to come by and they're much bigger, so they're more inspiring. A tiger actually has a, tiger penis is about, like it's a small organ. For such a big kind of virile animal, it's a pretty, 
it's kind of a small organ. So uh, not very inspiring for the person who's consuming the tiger penis soup. So <laughs> anyway, uh, that's, I, I, because of her, I was like, that's a really interesting job. She also maintains the hair library, a hair library, <laughs> which is hairs, like every, every animal has, not every, I'm like, uh, lots of animals have four or five different kinds of hairs. It's very hard to identify a hair because mm -hmm. an animal may have, uh, you know, underbelly, hair, uh, regular hair, I'm not using, these are not technical terms, um, guard hairs, which are the thicker ones on top, you know, facial hair is, di you know, different length, different thickness. So she, whenever an animal dies at a zoo, she's like, send me some hair. And so she put together this reference library of hair. And that's like very, very, very Mary Roach thing. So I was like, I don't know, there might be some book that would include her and her work. And so I uh, went up to the lab there and Anyway, I didn't end up in writing about that particular br branch of forensics just because um, if an investigation is underway legally, I couldn't tag along with the investigator. Mm -hmm. Just legally, open case, no, you can't. You can't come with us. <laughs> so that that was a deal breaker for me because I just, you know, I like to be able to describe things as they happen and... Um, I didn't want to tell it in the past tense. So uh, I didn't end up going that direction, but it kind of I turned into fuzz in a okay. roundabout way. Yeah. Well, at least I know where I'll apply to once I'm fired from this job. <laughs> <laughs> the hair library. Yes. <laughs> you can be the head librarian for the hair library. <laughs> I want to get a borrowing card for the oh, hair yeah. library. You do know I'm probably going to use somewhere in the caption for this or some posts. Penises get shipped here and there. That's a quote <laughs> from here. <laughs> yes. Mary Roach there's, quote. Your, there's your pull quote. <laughs> <laughs> so we're at the halfway mark. Um, if you have questions from Mary, please put it in the chat. Um, if not, I still have plenty more questions. And that's one of the good things about being a fan is that I get to kind of geek out and just <laughs> as things have been on my mind the whole time. So one of the things I was wondering, you seem to have a very curious mind when it comes to science. And I was wondering, outside of your own research, do you or how do you scratch that itch to know more information? Um, well, books. You know, <laughs> books. You know, I... Uh, I love to come across, you know, there's a, um, there's a book club called the Peculiar Book Club that um, Brandy Scalache does. It's, a, it's a online, and she has authors on, for example, recently she had on this woman, Megan Rosenblum, who wrote a, she's a curator and an archivist, and she wrote a book about um, books, it's a historical book, books that are covered in hum, human skin it's like dermatobibliophagy or some amazing word. Anyway, she um, there's a there was a new way to to determine because the, there's all there's lots of libraries, you know, libraries that have old old books, <clears throat> um, ar um, archives and and places that have books with very old bindings and there's rumors like this is supposed this book was bound in human skin and and nobody's ever known if that's a rumor anyway she uh, there's a there's a was uh, there's a way to test now that doesn't require damaging the book you know like cutting a piece of it out uh so she was looking into the provenance of those books and are they in fact human skin who might they have been and, and trying to tell the story of some of the people um but first of all, who bound the book, who might have been used to bind the book, and you know, very respectful and very interesting. So that kind of thing. Um, the, she was an author on uh, the Peculiar Book Club. Um, uh, there's one now, um, The Face Maker, which is about Dr. Gillies, who in World War One was the uh, pioneered all these facial reconstruction techniques. It's sort of the early, the earliest moments of plastic surgery and just a really moving story. So anyway, uh, I love to stumble onto books like that where somebody else has kind of come across this very specific corner of science and, and just jumped in and 
looked into it in a really um, interesting and thorough way. So, so books, I would say books are, are I guess, how I scratch that itch, really. And also, okay. I, you know, I like to, uh, I sit next to somebody on a plane, I'm always like, oh, what do you do? You know, I was like, just people, people are endlessly interesting. Uh, yeah, I think uh, you'll find more interesting stories just talking to people than you will mucking around on the internet. Okay. <laughs> that I mean, that's perfectly fine. I'm not going to talk to people on the plane at all. I'm a total <laughs> introvert. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but, I mean, I understand. I mean, I'm definitely, I wrote down the Peculiar Book Club. Yeah. I still have a wish to see the, um, what's the one in Sweden, the book? The, is it the Devil's Bible? Uh, oh, oh, I, I don't know if that, um, it's probably in that book, but mm -hmm. I don't know. That one's one I think made with human skin as well. Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting book. She's um, a really good researcher and just just did a really good job. And it was just interesting, you know, that they went they went to these libraries and they took the samples and they were able to get the they really get the answers kind of um, so lay to rest some of these or just answer the question because a lot of times libraries have these books and they're not quite sure. You know, people come in, they want to see them, they ask questions about them. And they're a little, you know, they're a little, they're a little uncomfortable with it, especially now when you're like, well, whose skin was that? And is it respectful to let people gawk at it? And, and, and you know, how do, would we repatriate not knowing who it is? You know, the, uh, and it's all over the map who the, you know, I mean, the one I know from Stiff is, you know, the story of Burke and Hare, um, those <clears throat> guys who were, uh, smothering people and then selling their bodies to the anatomists for the early anatomy schools in the 1800s. And one of them, of course, now I'm forgetting which, Burke or Hare. Anyway, uh, when they, they were um, killed, I mean, they were, they were caught, convicted, and executed. And um, their skin was used to make, I think they were wallets. And those still exist. Um, I think it was Burke because as you know, with my last name, that's kind of memorable to me. Oh, yes, right. Like you've been burked. <laughs> you've been burked. Yes, you've been burked, which is like put a pillow over somebody's face. Yeah, you've yeah. been burked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it was Burke. Was Burke the one who became you know, I don't remember. If it, I don't remember. Or any wallets. I can't yeah. remember. I can't remember. I'm going to have to. I guess we'll all have to reread it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Buy the new release and read it. <laughs> yes, there's a new, it's a, a spiffy new cover. I like that. They're redesigning the backlist, so I have some fun new covers. So oh, so. Stiff, yeah. So is is it going to also be the other ones as well? Yeah. Yes, they're all, mm, October, the rest of the backlist will be coming out with the spiffy new covers. Yep. I've, is there I've any had additional one. information in is there any additional information in, in Stiff? Then? There is. Yes, I did a. Um, I I add an uh, like a twenty-page epilogue to Stiff, mm -hmm. which uh, kind of brings things up to date. A little bit. Yeah, yeah, that was fun to do to to get back in touch with some of the people from way back when, and and to talk to uh, new folks. So yeah, Stiff has. <clears throat> um, that one is out. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, I'm gonna make a little note for myself. Sorry, guys, I had to go buy stiff again. Stiff again. It's only it's only <laughs> twenty new pages. It's not, but yes, I'm not 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 to discourage you from purchasing <laughs> a book. <laughs> <laughs> so we do have a question in the chat from Megan, which that name I didn't butcher. I just want to let you know I'll probably butcher your name in the chat if you're anyone else. So Megan says that you inspired her to be an organ donor. Um, she wants to know, I don't know if you can reveal it, what your next book will be about and how it will impact your readers. Oh, well, I'm, uh, I'm just, uh, I, I'm not really at a point where I'm ready to share it, but it is, it does, it does have to do with the human body again. So, hmm. you know, I kind of, I, I, I've gone back and forth, you know, the, it's kind of, that's kind of my home turf, you know, the human body. So I'm, I'm back in it. Yep. All right. So, I mean, that's pretty revealing. <laughs> that's good. I'm excited. Yeah, we were good. speculating at home what it could possibly be. And <laughs> now we know it's the human body. So we have Laura in the chat. She is a big fan of your books. Um, Hi, Laura. 
Do you read your own audiobook versions? Oh, great question. Thank you, Laura. I just did for Fuzz for the first time. And I now wish that I had read all of it. I didn't do it because I thought it's better to leave it to professional uh, actors. Uh, I just thought that there's a reason why these people exist and, and who am I to, I, you know, I don't know. So I, 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 I never did until this book read the uh, audio book, but it, I, I really enjoyed it. And I got pretty good f feedback. Like it wasn't a total disaster as I thought it might be. Um, I, and, and if I do it again, I'm going to insist that they include outtakes, bloopers, you know, because there was a lot, we had a lot of fun, but a lot of the fun gets cut out because it's, it's you, you know, it's moments where I, there would be a word where I, <laughs> I could not get it right and be like, okay, take 25. Um, and uh, so, so going forward, yes, I will be do I will continue to do them. And I would, um, you know, and I, not to, not to belittle the art of a professional audiobook readers because I think they're very good and, and particularly you know with with fiction where you're voicing different you are one person and you're voicing you know 10 different characters that's that's an amazing that people are able to do that um, so uh, but but I did but I, I I did enjoy it and hope to do it again yeah it actually shocked me uh, we were doing a book club for fuzz recently and one of our librarians said that she was doing an audiobook and she said that you were reading and it was like, oh, I didn't expect that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, the, the, the woman who read Stiff, I got a lot of good feedback on her. Shelly Fraser, I think. People loved her. She, she, we, we couldn't get her for any future ones, so I'm not sure. I think each book had a different reader. And um, uh, yeah, anyway, yeah, it's the first time. Okay, so while we're on the topic of re-releases, and your publicist is going to love this one. Okay. <laughs> you recently released Packing for Mars for Kids, which is one of the best children's book of 2022 so far, per Amazon. What prompted you to release a children's book? Uh, two things. Uh, three. Well, first of all, um, my, my publisher, W.W. W. Norton, um, they didn't used to have a young readers department, and now they do. So the editor there, Simon Boughton contacted me and said, "Would you <clears throat> be interested in in doing this? Particular, you know, for packing for Mars. Would, you know, that seems like a good one, the astronaut one. Um, and it was COVID. That's reason number two. COVID. I was kind of between books. I couldn't go anywhere. Um, there was, I was looking for projects that I could do from home, and and uh, that." was one, you know, take 80,000 words, bring it down to 20,000 words and rewrite all 20,000. Uh, and, and that was, again, it was, it was something I didn't necessarily think would be fun, but was, it was, it was, once you get into the rhythm of it, it, it really was kind of satisfying to, um, to turn that book into a, you know, I wanted to keep some of the, the voice and attitude and, and the, the fun and, uh, but, but obviously, couldn't be written exactly the same way. And certainly the zero gravity intercourse chapter is gone. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering. <laughs> uh, yeah. So some, yeah, some chapter, it, it, and it, so it was pretty obvious which ones should go in and which ones shouldn't. So um, it, uh, that, so that's, that's why, you know, it was um, partly my, my publisher and partly COVID and, and, and partly my, um, you know, I know that stiff, there's a lot of high schools that use stiff as summer reading or science class reading. And I love that fact. I love that um, reaching a young audience and getting them interested in science is one of the things that I, I <clears throat> is gratifying about what I do. So I thought, it, I, I've always thought it would, it's something that could be fun and valuable. So, so when they approached me, I was um, eager to do it. Okay. Should we expect some of your other books to get the same treatment? Yeah. Uh, well, not Bonk, probably. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I think actually the next one that my editor there is suggesting is Stiff. So um, I think that, that we probably will do that one. 
um, not right now because I'm, I'm I'm focused on the adult book that I'm working on. But uh, when that's turned in, you know, there's always a span of at least nine months between when you turn in a finish a book and when it comes out. And um, I, <clears throat> that's a nice time for a project like that. So that I probably will do it then. Yeah. Okay. So I think I wanted to go back to um, a little bit about research. Yeah. And I was wondering, um, how do I phrase this question? I don't know if you know this, but um, you've written quite a few books. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not James Patterson amount, but it's quite <laughs> impressive for someone who actually writes their book. Yes. Some shade. Yeah. <laughs> you can cut that out in the final edit. <laughs> Now that you have multiple New York Times best-selling novels, do you find it easier or harder now that you have some notoriety to do research? Does it open more doors, close more doors when you? Oh, definitely, oh, definitely opens more doors. Um, when I wrote, when I worked on Stiff, uh, nobody knew who I was, and they didn't know what I was up to, and. When you work with cadavers, uh, you're always a little bit wary of the media because it's so easy to make something sound really salacious and like you're disrespecting the dead. You know, it's so easy to do that with cadaver research. So those people were like, I don't know who you are, but I got no reason to talk to you. Nothing in it for me. <laughs> so uh, that was the hardest one. It's been progressively easier, you know, uh, to, to find somebody who's like, oh, I know your work. I love your books. That makes my job so much easier. I don't have to kind of explain, you know, my book. It's not a textbook, <laughs> not a textbook. It's they're fun. They're fun science books. Uh, you know, if somebody knows by having read one of my books, they know what I do and, and they like it. And so they're like, yeah, come on, you know, come on down. You know, happy to have you here. What can we do to help? And that, so that, um, and some, so sometimes what I, I end up, you know, I'll go on, say, LinkedIn, if it's somebody who's in a corporation, and, and I'll look up the name of the corporation and see who works there and just like send a bunch of emails. Cause it's like at some point somebody's going to go, oh, I read one of your books. And I'm like, that is my, that person is my entry to that world because they get it, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's made it easier. I would say it's made it easier. That's yeah. good. Yeah. That's good. Good it did, you, you know, and I wasn't sure uh, early on. I thought it might make it harder because people were like, I don't know. She's kind of out there. I don't know what she's <laughs> going to do. <laughs> um, no, it, 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 that's been a that's hugely helpful because things that, over the years, things have shut down more. Like, you know, try to get a tech company to talk to you. Anybody in a tech company, they're very, you know, companies and corporations and even academic institutions, they've become, they're wary of liability, they're wary of how they're going to be presented and, and whether they're coming across properly. And so it's just easier for them to not take a, any kind of risk. You know, there's nothing, nothing, and there's nothing really in it for them. I don't blame them for doing that. But so, so people like that, the people who have read my work and I mean, that's how I ended up getting on a nuclear missile submarine. It was this guy at the Naval, Med Naval Medical Submarine Research Laboratory. I'm probably getting one of those words wrong. And he's like, you know, I, I, I've read your book and I, books and I like what you do. And I, we have a good story to tell here. And I'm going to make this happen. And I retire next year. So I don't give a, <laughs> a poop. So he, uh, he really d made it happen because otherwise... There's no, I mean, it, it took a year as it was to get on to that thing, but um, uh, without him, it wouldn't happen. So, yeah, that helps. That helps a ton. Okay. I, yeah, I, I figured that would be the answer, but I wasn't sure if someone's like, oh, no, I'm not going to talk to that cadaver lady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I, I thought the same thing initially. I wasn't sure. I'd been marked. <laughs> <laughs> Stay away from her. So I want to get this last question in. Well, it's my second to last question. Um, I don't know. It's a fun one that I heard from somewhere else, and I just felt like I had to ask it when I had the chance to for someone with some kind of clout. Okay. So to me, you're famous, and all famous people have haters. 
I don't make the rules, okay? I just follow them. <laughs> so do you, Mary Roach, have any haters out there? Um, I, uh, so, not, everybody has haters. I think that I, I have plenty of haters that I don't know about because I don't, I don't read my Amazon or Goodreads. I don't, I don't go on and read my one star reviews, you know, so sure. I have haters uh, I, or, or my books have haters more to the point. There's people, who's, I mean, that's how it is with books. There's always going to be people, people who hate your books, but personal haters, the one that comes to mind, um, there was a woman, a, a professor of anatomy, and this was after Gulp came out, which had to do with the alimentary canal, you know, the, the everything between the mouth and the butt, the tube. Um, <laughs> so, she, so, um, and I was on the Daily Show, and I, I was talking about the stomach, the lining of the stomach, and why the stomach doesn't eat itself. Anyway, it's the Daily Show. I only have five minutes, and um, I didn't, I didn't mention the mucus layer which was an oversight. I should have mentioned that. Anyway, so she wrote this note to them that came up, you know, like, it was like within the hour on their website, a comment that's like, you don't know what you're talking about. And, you know, and these writers who, you know, take the human body and they don't know anything and they, you know, make money off it. And it was this like, she hates she me. Is. Oh my God. <laughs> Um, if not that she, she'd never read, uh, uh, she'd not, not read my work. It was just on the basis of my appearance on the daily show. She went, she also put a comment on, um, Amazon, uh, for the book. Yeah, she was just really, really, and, and I think there's probably, there are other people out there like her who feel that, um, you know, cause I'm picking and choosing the mm -hmm. fun elements of. You know, in that case, you know, the alimentary canal and di the digestive system. So I'm not giving a thorough explanation. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to, it's a, it's a pretty superficial treatment in, in terms, you know, compared to what you could present about how the body works. So I, I bet there's other people like her who feel like I'm um, sacrificing the science for the sake of entertainment. I'm sure there's plenty of people like her, but anyway, maybe not as nasty as her. <laughs> I mean, she hasn't even seen American Idol yet. Just wait. <laughs> yeah. yeah <right. laughs> Maybe she's the one star rating. Maybe. Maybe yeah. that's her. Yeah. Angriest American Idol contestant. Yeah. Did we <laughs> tell people yeah, that was your first, was that your first question or was that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that, that was, that was my second one, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. That. I couldn't remember if we talked about that before, before we went live, in which case people would be like, oh my God, she was on American Idol. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, with people like that, I imagine there are some out there, but I don't know, when I think of your books, I don't think it's supposed to be a complete picture. I kind of no. feel like it's kind of like a gateway drug, yeah, exactly. to say the least, exactly. to, the hard, to the hard stuff. Yep. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I feel like there's, I mean, there. Uh, my job is to pull people in and get them excited about science and then if they decide to pursue uh, an education and a career, that's when that lady steps in and talks about the mucus layer. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know. I, it's just one person so far, but I was just curious. I guess everyone does have a hater. The more, uh, the more you I get. don't think that you do, Sheldon. I don't think you have a hater. I don't know. I, I don't know. There could be some other librarian in another library out there. Just like <laughs> one star rating. <laughs> <laughs> Reference questions, terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'll, I'll have to keep an eye out there. Yeah, I mean, no, I do don't. have a book. The, 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 the trick is to not keep an eye out for it because you get you know so what? much nice feedback. And, and that stuff, oh, yeah. you know, you hear it and it it's lovely, but the things that always stay with you are the nasty ones, unfortunately, or at least that's the case with me, you know. Yeah, I remember um, it must have been Roger Federer. Um, tennis star yeah it says that i mean he has like multiple grand slam champions and he just says that it's the losing that he remembers the most yes it just yep. sticks with you of course yeah 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 okay i know i know this guy really talented novelist um he got this crazy review in the new york times i mean i've read the book that it was about and it's a 
it's a beautiful book. He's a great writer. He went he was a Stegner fellow at Stanford. He's he teaches. He's I mean he's just so talented. And and he got this review in the Times. And I remember and he could quote it word for word. It stuck with him like so viciously. He uh, every yeah he was just quoting lines from it. You know. Wow. Um, and I don't think that's the case with all the many many positive reviews that he'd gotten. Yeah. Yeah. It's just human nature, unfortunately. Yeah, that's why you don't read the reviews. <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. Yep. Okay. So this is my, I think I only have time for one more question. So, I mean, since you're such a good sport for coming here at some ungodly hour, <laughs> you don't know, it's nine o'clock where she is. It's not noon like it is in most of Florida. Um, so, Mary, the last question I have for you today is, where can we follow you and keep up with the latest happenings of Mary Roach after this program? Oh, okay. The the um, Well, I'm on Twitter, uh, but uh, lately I've been not so much uh, posting but or tweeting. But uh, Mary underscore Roach is my Twitter name, and uh, that is where I announce appearances uh everything you know i i have the um paperback to fuzz my most recent book comes out in september so toward the end of august you'll be hearing a lot from me because <laughs> it's book launch time so that that is an and maryroach.net my website there are excerpts a table of contents there's there's like summaries of the book information about all of the books there um so that's a good place to sort of, if you're interested in checking one of them out, that's a good place to go. MaryRoach.net. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so that's pretty much it that I have for you. I mean, yeah. Mary, I really want to thank you for joining us today um, for this great conversation. I had a lot of laughs. I'm going to definitely quote penises get shipped here and there <laughs> please do <laughs> <laughs> so i want to thank you really i mean you're awesome you've been very agreeable and approachable i mean i'm still in awe that you answered back my email and just says call me and is like what yeah, That's no I, yeah. i'm i am a big fan of libraries i just read susan orlean's book the library book i believe it's called it, about the la the fire at the la library and uh, it's about libraries in general it's just sort of a love story to libraries and she's one of my favorite writers susan orlean um, mm -hmm. uh, but i love that book because i love libraries i was uh as a um, kid my dad always took me to the library because he was retired when i was born so um i i'm happy to support libraries <laughs> Thank you. And I will return the favor once I get to my seventh best selling book. <laughs> <laughs> but for now, all I can say is really thank you. And thank you on behalf of all the people of Broward County, Florida, and everyone that's here today who's an amazing fan of you. Oh, thank you so much, Sheldon. Thanks. It was really fun to talk to you. And hello and thank you to everybody there. I'm, uh, I know Delray Beach. Uh, my mother in law lives there. So um, my husband and I go there all the time. And uh, it's beautiful, and uh, I'm I'm happy to uh, have spent my ungodly early hour. <laughs> I was I was up at seven. Uh, it was lovely. Thank you all.